Hello and welcome to SETI Live. I'm your host, Beth Johnson, communication specialist here at the SETI Institute. Thank you to all of our viewers from around the world for joining us today. And please let us know where you are watching from. Also, welcome in to our listeners on the podcast version of SETI Live, which is available on most podcast platforms. Today, I have the privilege of being joined by Dr. Cecilia Garapo. She is from the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. I still love that name and how we have to write it out all the time. And she is here to talk to us today about TRAPPIST 1E. So, for those of you who may not remember, TRAPPIST 1 is a star around which seven planets have been discovered. And it sort of makes it the most Earth like planetary system like our, it's like our solar system out of everything we've discovered so far and on top of that there are at least three rocky worlds within the so-called habitable zone where water can be liquid so this system has been a huge target since uh, jwst went up everybody wants to know can we find life on these worlds is there a possibility dr garfo cecilia it's not looking good is it <laughs> I do not want to be the uh, bearer of bad news. Uh, no, I. It's not looking good. <laughs> I. Are, yeah. The, the, the spoiler alert is: I doubt there's an atmosphere in any of these planets. Oh no. Okay. So take us, back to the, take, take us back to the beginning of of the research being done on on Trappist One. So the system yeah. was uh, discovered back in so the the star itself wasn't discovered until 2016 then like the world's or 20, 2001 was when the star was discovered then we started finding these planets in 2016 and then we discovered that there's no seven of them in 2017 so for the last seven years or so you've been working on this particular system how did this start what was the first thing you guys thought about yeah so um we, we were very excited about the system, of course, and what, I'm, what I've am what i been focusing on is the space weather um, around exoplanets. So the um, environment in which, in which these planets uh, are and, and are exposed to, similarly to what Earth is exposed to the solar wind and, and, and flares and coronal mass ejections and the concerns we have here about the sun. Um, we have them also in, in other planets. And so these planets are around a very low mass star. And so the habitable zone, that is the, the orbital distance or so the distance from the star at which the temperature from the, the provided from the star uh, is consistent with liquid water. So between zero and 100 Celsius, uh, that region is what is typically called the habitable zone. And because we think that, you know, from our own experience and the only life we know of, we know that water is, is a good way to start life. Uh, so we look at that. And the excitement about this, this uh, particular um, system is that there are rocky planets in the habitable zone. However, the habitable zone might be a misleading term because it's a necessary, we think necessary, but not, not sufficient condition for life to exist. And so we started to, we simulated the space weather of these planets. Um, and the problem is that if you, if you'd like, I can show you some uh, images, but the, the long story short is that it, when, when a planet, these stars that are lower mass, so this star is like, is about 0.1, so 10% of the mass of the sun, the star in, in the center of the system. And that means it's much cooler. And so for the planets to be in the habitable zone, they have to be very close to a star, very close. Um, actually, I might have wrong, I might have said wrong the mass of the star, but this distance to the to the star from the closest in planet is um, 0 0.01, so 1% of, so it's 100 times closer to the star than the sun is to the earth. And also these, these stars, lower mass stars are very active magnetically. In the magnetic activity drives stellar winds like the solar wind. And those can are much stronger if the, this, the star is more magnetic. And also if the planet is very close, they're exposed to much stronger winds. We think stellar, the solar wind is uh, responsible for eroding the Martian atmosphere. And this is a situation that is much more extreme. We calculated that uh, for TRAPPIST, 
planets, the the pressure from the stellar mm -hmm. wind is about 10,000 times what we experience on Earth from the solar wind. So you have a, a, a much smaller star, a much closer in set of planets, and a massive stellar wind affecting these planets. So no, that doesn't sound like a really great recipe for life. Yeah. How, how does the, our magnetosphere, so we talk about, you know, the basis, the basis for looking for life in exoplanetary systems is always this sort of so-called habitable zone where water is liquid or could be liquid. Uh, but it's, there's obviously there's more to it than that, right? That's sort of that like baseline. This is what we're looking for. And then, you know, kind of to narrow down sort of the target worlds that we look at, but there's obviously more to it. So in, with regards to say earth, how does our like magnetosphere, how do we prevent that solar wind from affecting us so much that like life was able to develop here? Yeah, that's a great question. Actually, that is the hope of every planet that is in, in this kind of environment or in an environment with any stellar wind, in particular the solar wind. So the Earth has a magnetosphere because the Earth has a magnetic field and that provides a, pro, uh, a protection. It kind of builds, it has these streamers that, that build like this shield against the solar wind. And that is how the Earth protects from, from the solar wind. And that is the case, we believe, in most planets that are magnetic. Um, so we thought we did study this, taking into account the magnetic fields that are compatible with the planets in this system. Because of the mass, you can tell what are the boundaries of it could be, you know, the magnetic field could be up to this. And also we compared it in, with the case in which the magnetic field is the same as in Earth. So here's the problem. If you have a very strong field, wind 10,000 times stronger than what we experience from the solar wind. That magnetosphere, imagine you have the same strength of the magnetosphere, the same shield, is going to be pushed a lot more. So it's going to end up being a much smaller magnetosphere um, and it provides less protection. And so that puts the planet at risk of atmospheric stripping. So just pushing the atmosphere with the pressure of the wind. But in addition, uh, what we found in 2017 was that in the particular case of TRAPPIST-1, that is a very extreme low mass star, right? There's others like Proxima b is very, very, is close in planet to, to a low mass star, but not that extreme. In this case, um, the, the magnetic field of the star that drops very quickly with orbital distance, mm -hmm. because the planets are so close in, ends up connecting to the magnetic field of the planet, according to our simulations. And so now the planet having a magnetic field might be actually a worse scenario than not having one. I mean, I wouldn't choose one or the other to go visit, but um, the, if the magnetic field lines from the star connect with the magnetic field lines of the planet, then that actually provides highways for the particles of the wind to go directly onto the planet if it had an atmosphere to deposit these particles with it right uh, on in the atmosphere of the planet and that would yeah th that would be very eroded to to the atmosphere but that the latest paper like what we just found is that there's a third mechanism with the with the, we knew there was this mechanism but we wanted to to uh, calculate the amount um, there's another reason why these atmospheres are at risk, and it's called dual heating. So the the planets are in a in a plasma in a in an environment in a space where their environment where there are magnetic fields. The magnetic fields come from. I'm talking about the stellar magnetic fields now, right? This is an active star, and again, the less massive the star is, the more active typically it is. It depends on the rotation, but but for the same rotation, less mass means more active. Um, so the planet, if it's very close in, is going to orbit much faster its own star. Mm -hmm. And the magnetic fields, when they're strong and the, and the planet is very close to a star, are much less uniform than the magnetic fields around that, that the Earth goes through. Mm -hmm. So this means the planet goes through very quick transitions that are large 
in in the magnitude of the magnetic field. So it goes through low mag lower magnetic field to faster, and the other way around, sorry, from lower magnetic field to stronger very quickly. These changes in magnetic field um, create currents in the upper part of the atmosphere of the planet, if it has an atmosphere. And these currents dissipate um, just like our resistance, right? The, the upper the ionosphere of a planet is conductive, but is not a perfect conductor. And so because it's not, then it dissipates and it generates heat. And mm -hmm. so the heat, we calculated it and is huge for this planet, is expected to be huge. It's, it's, it's bigger than, than the extreme ultraviolet radiation. So we always knew that radiation is we always thought of radiation, high energy radiation as the mechanism that will put a planet atmosphere at risk of evaporation. But now we find that the joule heating uh, could be dominant and could be huge. So if this, if you're heating the upper parts of the atmosphere of a planet, then you lose those layers and eventually you lose all the atmosphere in what we think is a very quick effect in this case, just because of the magnitude we expect it to be. Oh wow! Not, so it's, just, it's 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 layers upon layers of not good news. Okay, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna welcome in uh, the good news is that there's people. plenty of planets out there. This is just okay. a very particular. One. All right, we'll we'll talk about that in just a second. Let me welcome in people. Uh, let's see. So we have people watching from uh, Montreal, Canada, Finland, Toronto, Canada. New Jersey, uh, India, Germany, Louisiana, Poland, Texas, Wisconsin, California, uh, more Louisiana. Uh, hello, Ron. Uh, Tanzania, France, Greece. Um, you throw flags at me and I, I can't necessarily recognize them in little tiny emojis. Uh, Michigan, Romania, uh, wow, uh, UK, well, we're coming from all over, Scotland, Oregon, welcome in everybody, welcome in. So um, I am speaking with Dr. Cecilia Garafo uh, about um, how not habitable uh, Trappist, the Trappist-1 system is turning out to be as we've been looking at it with JWS team. Um, but it's not, the, it's not great news, but again, this is one planetary system that we have found and there are, 5,000 plus planets for us to look at. So not not the worst thing in the world, but you know, everybody wanted JWST to look at the system like right off the bat. And so that's what you all are doing. It's exactly what you all are doing. You're doing what everybody wanted. Um, how did you get involved in this particular research? Where, what led you into this? Uh, so I'm a, I'm a computational stellar astrophysicist. I did, uh, my path was not very traditional. I started, my, my PhD was in theoretical physics, looking at studying black holes in higher dimensions, so not very related. But then I I came to the CFA and I started collaborating with uh, Jeremy Drake, who's, who's both a theorist and an observer, I think. But he said uh, they were doing all this theoretical work on computational astrophysics, because all that I've been talking about are our simulations. Um, and so I started to work on, on stellar astrophysics and I really liked it uh, a lot. And especially the impact, how important the star is for the planet it hosts. Um, we like to say, know thy star, know thy planet. You, you, you really have to know the star to be able to assess the planet. Mm -hmm. More so if the, if the planet is close to the star. So. Yeah, the, one of the problems I think is we're looking at planets that are very close to the star just because those are the easiest to detect. But it's full of planets out there. So I do expect that there's life out there. It's just not, probably not in Trappist 1. Right, there, there, we, we do know that because of the methods that we use for finding stars, primarily having been the transit method, that it, it, this, the, the results are a bit biased on things that we can see very easily, which are generally closer into their stars or bigger. <laughs> so th yes, this is going to be a problem. Um, I'm gonna switch gears a little bit. So one of the things that I wanted to also talk to you about is you are the founding director for a new program at the CFA called Astro AI. Yes. And, and so 
machine learning and artificial intelligence, of course, is becoming a huge thing with all of the massive amounts of data that we're getting in, in astrophysics and, and planetary science even. So what is this new program and, and what are you working on? What, where are you going with this? Yeah, so uh, along in my career, I, I told you up to the point where I started to work in stellar astrophysics, but then I was very interested uh, for a long time in artificial intelligence and machine learning. And eventually I went to the computer science department in Harvard to teach their master classes and do research on pure methods. And then I came back. And so my profile is a little bit of the background in both astrophysics and computer science. And I would, and so the, when I came back to the CFA, I found that there was a huge need. People were asking for help with machine learning and AI that has a lot of um, potential for astronomy. And so I decided to start a pilot program, which became very, it, it kind of exploded. Uh, we went from four projects in three months to 37 projects. So it, it did wow. go out of proportion because I think there's so much potential. Um, so what we're doing is, I think there's two main things, right? With the big data that we're entering a bit, a, an era of big data and astronomy, we're gonna observe more than we have like in a year, we're going to observe more than we have observed so far. So there's a huge potential for discovery. But when you have too much data, you, if you don't have enough the good, the right methods to analyze it, then it's a lot of data. It doesn't mean a lot of discoveries. If we want to to translate the amount of data into a, a similar revolution for discovery, we do need um, the right models and artificial intelligence is great for big data. We, we're going to observe a million supernova a year instead of a hundred or two. We cannot no longer follow up pointing all the telescopes to those. But the other reason is because with machine learning and AI, you can look for things that you don't know are there. Uh, unlike with traditional methods, you can intentionally look to discover patterns that you didn't didn't know existed. With traditional methods, you look for something that you expect is there, and you might find new things by accident, but this is an intentional way of looking for new things. And with so much data, I think the potential is, is huge. And we're working across astronomy. So we're going from cosmology to biomarkers and exoplanets atmospheres that I think might be interesting for this audience and is a very exciting uh, project few projects that we're working on. So it's a whole, we have a whole science pillar on that. And the idea is that right now the search for, for biomarkers. So biomarkers are, um, are molecules that we think are correlated or, or that indicate there's life in a planet. So if you find a biomarker a molecule in an exoplanet atmosphere, if it is a biomarker, then you, you, you think there's life there. Right. Um, the focus is right now um, in looking for five biomarkers that we know uh, because of Earth. But so we did build a model. This is very expensive. Typically, the signal to noise is very low. We are we're looking for the first time we're able to look at molecules in exoplanet atmospheres with JWST. But um, the resolution is, of course, we're stretching it, and so. Um, we are building models with computer vision experts like Bill Freeman in MIT and his group. Um, then we have the exoplanet experts like Mercedes Lopez Morales. We have at the CFA Hytran that is a great, uh, the most widely used database for molecular spectroscopy. So with the whole team, we have built a model to retrieve um, biomarkers from exoplanet atmospheres from the observations. That is a very difficult problem for the five biomarkers that we know of. That was a, a, a project led by Mayel Abin, who was a, a, a visiting student here that won um, the European Space Agency data challenge for one of their missions that is going to be launched, Ariel, to look at exoplanet atmospheres and hopefully find biomarkers. But the potential here, I think, is to go further and look for a lot more biomarkers, which changes the chances of finding life elsewhere in the universe. So changing the amount of molecules we're looking for and pushing with these computer vision experts, I'm really hoping we can push the signal to noise to find signatures that are very dim and that are very hard for traditional methods to detect. But AI is good at finding these 
subtle correlations and patterns that are not obvious to the human eye or tra tra traditional methods. So I think pushing these two fronts, the signal to noise and the amount of molecules we're looking at, we're going to make it a lot more likely to find biomarkers in exoplanet atmospheres. Probably not in Trappist one, but there's so many out there. <laughs> So uh, thank you, and I'm very excited for uh, the new um, this new project. Uh, again, there's so just so much data coming in between you know Gaia. Uh, we've got a project at the VLA that's just piggybacking and pulling in tons of data. Then we're going to have the uh, Vera Rubin, which is just going to survey everything all the time. Uh, you know, so there's so many things that are that are getting ready to come online or have been online. And, and we're just collecting data. And, and so this is, I think, a strikingly important aspect of where astrophysics research has to go. So very exciting. I'm glad that, that we have this going on. Thank you for leading it, for being the founding director. And also congratulations on, on hitting so many projects already. <laughs> well, we, have a, we have a lot of audience questions. And I got to say, our, our audience is bringing Bring in the heat today. So um, thank you, Julia Brawler, for the stars. But uh, let's let's move on to some of these questions. All right. One of the things that I forgot to bring up is the, and I don't think we mentioned this, is that the planets in the Trappist One system are also tidally locked. So the same side of the planet is facing the star all the time. This is how it works with our moon. We see the same face of the moon all the time. Um, <sighs> Is this a is this a positive or a negative factor for possible life? I think negative is not my expertise. Is uh, there's people working on planetary atmospheres, atmospheric models of circulation. Mm -hmm. I think it is a bad thing because you'll have you know a very hot side and a very cold side, and I think it's a bad thing. Uh, but I would have to, I don't, yeah, I don't want to say too much with too much confidence when I, that's not exactly uh, what I'm an expert on, but I would, I would say it's a bad thing. Fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, I like this one. Uh, a lot of Earth's water is in the crust. This is from Sally. So could this be a similar on other planets? Could water be re-released into the atmosphere after that initial atmosphere has been eroded away? So is there a chance for recovery for any of these planets? I think that's a great question that everybody has. And I don't have an answer to it. I do think that um, that would be more likely if it's something we'd have to calculate. If there's a chance of, of you know, recovery and, and re replenishing the atmosphere. However, I think that would be uh, not maybe so applicable to Trappist One system because it's still eroding. It is all the time this is happening. So whatever atmosphere you get is gonna prob most probably be eroded again and evaporated. Um, I do think it's a really interesting question in the case of uh, other systems. So people that detect exoplanets are very excited when they find a closing exoplanet around a not so active star because of the, all the concerns I've been talking about. If the star is no, not, not active or not so active, people tend to think, okay, then it's a great scenario. Then this, And then we simulate the environment and it, it does get better. But the concern is that stars spin down over the lifetime and the, the spin of the star gives you the magnetic field. And so typically when you find a star that is low mass, if it's not active, it's because it's an old star and it was active before. So it most likely lost the atmosphere already. In that case, then this mechanism of re, re, reestablishing an atmosphere could, could be interesting because then maybe there's a chance it won't get eroded or evaporate it again. Not in the case of Trappist 1, at least for now. Um, but I want to say that what we find is that the most important factor here is not the how, how strong is the activity of the star, as long as it's active, but how far the planet is from the star. That's the dominant effect, because there's also uh, the density around the star is much, much larger uh, at the planet's orbit. If the if the planet is close to a star, that actually brings me to I, I think I think you've answered one of the questions that uh, Nikki has asked, uh, which was does stellar wind and heating of atmospheres get weaker as the star ages? Uh, but they have also asked how far does an Earth-sized planet need to be from something from a, an active star like Trappist One to preserve the atmosphere? 
So is that a possibility or, you know, do we think there could be planets farther away that this might yeah. not apply to? Absolutely. So if it was the same star, the same size of a star, then it, ha it would have to be uh, a lot further and it would be outside of the habitable zone. So it would be uh, very cold maybe for life to exist when in the web space weather is good enough. But if we did simulate other systems that are not quite so low mass, uh, for example, TOI 700 from, um, is one of the systems, uh, and in that that is that is TESS, one of TESS objects of interest, and that is 0.4, so 40 percent of the mass of the sun. So it's still an M dwarf, so you can still detect the planets around them, but the habitable zone is further out enough that when we simulated conditions there, they're very similar to the Earth, so maybe three to four times the, the solar wind uh, the pressure, but that's different than 10,000. So, so the orbital distance is the most important. So I think the big promise is to look around sun-like stars. So we need more technology to detect more planets around them. I mean, we can, but, but you know, as, as technology advances, we will find uh, places more similar to, the, to, to Earth. Uh, but also already in M dwarf, so in less massive stars, but not so low mass, it's it's a better place to be looking at. Because then the habitable zone is further. And so you have them right. in the habitable zone and with better space weather conditions. And also they're less active, right? Because they're not so, they're a bit more massive. Um, okay, so there there is there is hope, but the main thing is we gotta look at, at more sun-like stars and, and just keep, progressing towards that true like Earth 2.0 concept. Yeah. Um, okay, uh, Jess is asking, what were the specific instruments on JWST that were used to make your models? To get your data? Um, we are doing models. We're not directly using the data. I use the data that other people retrieve, like the data on the star. We have a lot of data on the star. We have a lot of uh, data. Oh. Oh, you mean for the biomarkers? Maybe it means I, I for think the biomarkers. We use the spectrum. We, we need the, spe the spectra of the star. And then the way we do it, I guess, so the answer is twofold, just in case. For the models we do for space weather, we don't use JWST. For the, for the biomarkers project, we do. Um, get the spectrum. So that is, we look at the light of the star. And then we look again when the planet is eclipsing the star. And so we compare the light of the star before the eclipse with the light of the star during the eclipse. And the difference should be due to the imprints of that light passing through an atmosphere, if there is one. So the differences give us information about the planetary atmosphere but they're very subtle. And again, that's why I think signal to noise um, is something we need to push for and number of biomarkers as well. I hope that answers well, the question. Yeah, I think so. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Garfo, for uh, for being here. Um, I, I'm i sad about Trappist, but I'm not surprised. You know, really, really not surprised. I think we kind of knew just from the whole M dwarf thing that this was going to be an issue. Um, what is next for you? What are you working on next? Is it a completely focusing on Astro AI or are you still going to be working on Trappist and other stellar uh, wind scenarios? I'm work I'm focused on Astro AI just because it's a new thing and I have to put a lot of energy into it. I'm very excited, but I'm also working on, so my main thing is stellar rotation because that, if we can figure out the rotation evolution of stars, then we can figure out the magnetic evolution and that has a big impact on which stars are good hosts for exoplanets. So I'm still work working on that. I would like to say well, something. Uh, just sure, to be absolutely. Here if we have a minute or two. Yeah, go ahead. I'm, say, I'm very hopeful that there's life out there. I do not think we should have any hopes to move elsewhere, the, the Earth 2.0. I want to... I want to say that it's very important that we understand that it, there is no plan B to Earth. Mm -hmm. We have, we're the result of millions of years of evolution. Our planet, if it increases, the temperature increases two degrees, we are maybe extinguished. 
if there's a virus like COVID, we could be extinguished. We cannot hope to move to a completely different, um, you know, biodiverse planet and, and survive. So I do not, I, I strongly believe that all this research is great. And I hope in my lifetime, I'm, I'm optimistic that we'll find life or signs of life elsewhere in the universe. And we might find, and there's plenty of places, probably similar enough to Earth in some sense, but I don't think we as humans can can move to another planet. So no, I think that's I, I think that's I think that's very fair. Um, as as someone is saying in chat, life is precious and fragile, and it's you know it, we want to know how easy it is to come by, but I don't think that means that we can go find a new place to live. I, I think the Earth 2.0 is just sort of that that uh, Kepler mission hope that we find an Earth-sized planet around a sun-like star in the habitable zone that we can look at and say, okay, that that has a good chance. Let's point everything at it. So Absolutely. that's that's what I'm hoping we find is that we do find those worlds in that area that that we can really, you know, yeah. drill down on scientifically and, and see if we can find life out there that isn't that isn't here. Because <laughs> this, yeah. this, is, this is what we have right now. This is all we have. I totally agree. I just want to make sure because this this reaches a big audience, just to make sure that it's clear that when we talk about Earth 2.0, it doesn't mean we can't move elsewhere. Right. I mean, most of and all these star systems that we're looking at, they are they are light years away. The closest one is still four something light years away, and we don't have the capability of, of moving people there. <laughs> yeah. So, exactly. Well, Cecilia, thank you so much for being here today. And, and I really appreciate that you joined us. And, and uh, your research is amazing. I know it's disappointing to a lot of people, but I think it's important that we find those, those negative results as well. It helps us, again, narrow in on, on worlds that we should focus on and look at. So it's, it's good that, that you've got this. And congratulations on the work. Congratulations on Astro AI and good luck to you um, in for that. Very excited for you to be working on the, all those projects. <laughs> Thank you, Beth, for having me. Thank you to all the viewers uh, for, for making the time to, to listen about, to hear about all this research. And hopefully in a few years, we'll be talking about something more exciting, like detecting a biomarker somewhere in the universe. God, I hope. And if that happens, I, I expect to hear from you immediately so that we can get you on here again. Absolutely. Um, all right. Uh, thank you, everybody, for watching, for joining in, for asking questions. That was that I had so many other questions I could have could have asked, um, and so feel free to uh, put those up on uh, YouTube or Facebook comments. Uh, and Cecilia can always check in and, and try to answer them from there. And um, once again, we are the SETI Institute. We are a five hundred one c three nonprofit organization. If you go to SETI.org uh, slash donate. You can help support our programs like this one, doing outreach um, and, and bringing these presentations and these scientists to you. And um, also we are gonna be back next week. Frank will be interviewing uh, someone about an Earth-sized exoplanet. So we're gonna keep on this theme of, of looking for these Earth-sized worlds and trying to find places where we think life could happen and we will be back next Thursday, so join us then. And don't forget that coming up on April 8th, we will have a massive three-hour SETI Live to cover the total solar eclipse. So come join us then, and we will have tons of guests and lots of telescopes, and hopefully you guys will get to be able to see totality quite a bit um, from wherever you are in the world that is not getting to see this, because I will still be here in California. I will only have a partial eclipse. So, all right, everybody, thank you again. Thank you, Cecilia, for joining us. Thank you to Hasmin and Rebecca uh, in the back for helping produce. And uh, we will see you next week.